We'll keep that here. Is that on Facebook? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I'm done for. You can sleep at our places. Okay? <laughs> All right, let's get your priorities straight. <laughs> Delta Rab, you talked about that in Tanya? <laughs> oh, priorities? Pedek <laughs> <laughs> Today we're going to do chapter 11. We'll start chapter 11. Now, really and truly, chapter 11 is a continuation of chapter 10. I touched upon this yesterday in my sermon, but I'm going to reiterate it for everybody's benefit. The notion, the notion that tshuva ilah, that the higher form of tshuva, which means to cleave unto God, not to focus on the minutia of sin, but rather to experience a greater and more intense and accelerated level of Avedis Hashem is something that can only follow Tshuva Tato, that can only follow the lower level of Tshuva. And at a very simple level, if the place is filthy, you gotta clean it up. To bring in a, a designer and to install new lights and bring in new furniture and change the wallpaper, if the place is filthy, it doesn't make any sense. It's great to enhance, it's great to pick it up a level. But you gotta do the basic cleaning first. You gotta make sure that, that we don't have the residual effects of sin that are still very much a part of the reality. So Tshuva Tata is what cleans out the actual impact of sin. And then when one is cleansed, the experience of having been distant from Hashem is supposed to become a launching pad to catalyze greater growth. Now here's the thing, Tshuva, Tata is, is a defined, lower form of tshuva is defined as tshuva is defined. It's about aziva sachet. It's about leaving sin behind. It's about charata al ha'ava. It's about a profound sense of regret for the past, which naturally leads into resolve for the future. Because if you really regret what you did, you're not going to do it again. If you're doing it again, you don't really regret it. And, and that's not a joyous activity, it's not fun to take a hard look at oneself, warts and all, and to see everything that's missing, everything that's inappropriate, and to, to, you know, to deal with one's own imperfections, and worse, is a sobering thing. It's a serious thing. Tshuva law, on the other hand, could be more of a joyous experience. The joy of reconciliation, the joy of renewal, the joy of coming back, and even more so. So what's an example of Tshuva law? In Vedic Yud, the Rebbe said that a prime example of Tshuva law, in addition to what he said previously with regard to studying Torah with greater intensity, that a prime example of Tshuva law is experiencing a more intense form of prayer, to daven, to, to pray with a greater sense of devotion, to cleave to Hashem during prayer in a more profound way. That becomes Tshuva law. That becomes a prime example of a higher form of Tshuva. Now, having said that, we do have a bit of a contradiction. On one hand, the Mishnah tells us, in Eindim Hispalal Elamitech Kevidresh, that prayer has to be done with a sense of sobriety and seriousness. Conversely, we have a Brisa that tells us, in Eindim Hispalal, a person has to pray with a sense of Simcha. And the Rebbe kind of apportions Kevidresh, which is seriousness, uh, you know, heavy headed approach, a sense of sobriety. He apportions that to the concept of tshuva tato, lower level of tshuva. And then he says that a higher level of tshuva could be found in the frames of joy, of, of, of a serene, kind of liberating, elevated feeling. So, so the problem is that most of us are not capable of experiencing these two poles at once. And if we're going to be serious and sober, we're not going to be happy and joyous. So how do you do both? How do you do both? Now, but I said, the, it's pretty hard these days for people to swing from one extreme to the other. Mm -hmm. So he suggested that on Thursday night you do Tikkun mm -hmm. and on Shabbos you experience this greater form of love, of connection, of closeness, of cleaving. And he said that Shabbos is the, the same Hebrew letters as the word Toshev. And he says specifically, David HaMelech and Tillam says Toshev Enosh, which is the lowest form of a person. But even an Enosh, even a person who doesn't have mastery over himself, even a person who isn't in the fullest sense, an Adama, in the image of, which means he's weak-minded. Even a person who isn't much of a mensch, which means he's not really an ish, he's not really a person who's got his emotions in check and pulled together. But a person who rather needs to take his gather, or, you know, as they say euphemistically, be a man, 
take, take, to, to, to be courageous enough to look at your weaknesses, to pick your enish up from the ground, and to elevate him to an ish or to another, as the Rebbe says, Mehayim Yeh. So the, the, the notion that Shabbos, we could experience an elevated and an uplifting level of closeness to Hashem, is metaphorized even and alluded to in the words, Toshev Enosh, which this is Shabbos. Shabbos allows even the Enosh to pony up and to serve Hashem with a sense of serene joy. And that's how we can have Tshuva Tato, followed a day later by Tshuva Yilo. However, the Alter Rebbe now begins chapter 11 by telling us, Omnom, and yet, here is something novel, here's something new. In order that a person might have in his heart a sense of profound humility, contriteness, which that is, as we said, that's the lower level of tshuva, as mentioned earlier. And then also he has the joy in Hashem, which means the joy he rejoices and he finds happiness and the fact that he's able to serve Hashem, he finds joy in his avodas, in, in, in his avodah, and the work and the efforts that he's been privileged to perform, and that in order they should be shtehim v'yachad, in order they should both be at the same time. Kvar milsa Lamadalad. The Alter Rebbe said we already spoke about this earlier in the first section of Tanya, in the end of the thirty-fourth chapter. That this is along the lines, as it is stated in the Holy Book of Zohar, that you can have chedva tekiya beliboi misitada. There could be joy implanted in the heart on one on one end, v'chulu. On the other end, he says you could have the opposite. That a sense of embitterment could be in the heart on the other end. This is a very strange statement. Al Rebbe just spent the latter part of chapter 10 telling us that we can't have harmony, that we can't balance the two. He even gave us different days, different activities to do on different days. He told us on Thursday night, that's when you do your tshuva tato. That's when you worry about the contriteness, and that's when you'll pull yourself together and in a sense of sobriety. And then, then the Friday will go by, and then you'll welcome Shabbos, and at Shabbat Kodesh, then you'll experience, experience the higher level, the more joyous kind of tshuva. All right. This all the have to be practical. Dealing with regular people here. The Tanya is the book of the every person. And every person has to be able to balance these extremes. And that's not really possible. Now the Altarebbe comes along. Just like you don't even turn the page. Straight into chapter 11. And he says, ah, but Omnom, in order that they should be together. I already talked about that. I described it in detail in the 34th chapter of the first section of Tanya. And this is not even a Tanya idea. It's a Zoharic idea. The Zohar says you can have Chedva, Tekiya, Belubay, Mesit, and and Chedva, Tekiya, and, and uh, the opposite should be on the other side. Joy on one, on one hand, and a feeling of the opposite, and uh, the bitterness is on the other side. And al Rebbe says... And now I'll tell you even more so why this is true. And then when you add to the mix a sense of faithfulness and a sense of trust, that your heart should be fully trusting in Hashem. Big difference in faith and trust. I can believe in something. The question is if I trust you. Do I trust you? And trusting, we have to trust Hashem. Not only have to believe in Hashem, we have to trust Hashem. So here's a person who says he places his trust in Hashem. He faithfully places trust in Hashem. What does he trust Hashem with? He trusts that Hashem is ki chesed hu. That God desires kindness. I trust that's the case. I faithfully trust that Hashem desires kindness. That he is chanun verachun. That he is gracious and that he is compassionate. That he has infinite patience and forgiveness. And take it from Yad Shemavakesh Mechilu Uslicha. As soon as I actually make the ask, I, 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 I request from Hashem, please forgive me. Me'ite is Baruch. So as it says, the Alter Rebbe now adds here in the parentheses, Keroi Vracham Mecha Mechei Pshoi, the way we ask in our prayer, in accordance with your abundant mercy, wipe away my sins. Kabseni, cleanse me. Tahareni, purify me. Mechol of and all of the residual effects of sin, Mechei, you should. 
blot out, erase the chulu. So belishum sofek esfek sfek that a person has absolute trust in Hashem, he faithfully trusts that if he makes this request and he asks, there's no doubt, none whatsoever, that Hashem is going to do this. And now the Rebbe says you can even demonstrate this from the fact that our blessings are structured in that way. As we recite in our Shmon Esrei, in our Amidah prayer, on a regular basis, on an average day, three times a day, every time we say the prayer known as Shmon Esrei, that we say, Tekef, Shemavakshem, Salach Lanu, we ask Hashem, forgive us. What do we say after? How does the prayer conclude? Baruch Ato Hashem, Chanun, blessed are you, God, Chanun, who is gracious, Hamar Belis Leach, who surely finds it within him, so to speak, to have an abundance of forgiveness. Now, you didn't say that God will consider forgiving us. You said he's marvelous. I asked and I blessed God. I'm already thanking him for having taken care of things just because I asked. Now, when it comes to blessings, here's one of the principles. There are a number of principles of blessings. One of the principles with blessings, with brachas, is that suffolk brachas lahakil. If in doubt, then always take the lenient approach. Don't make a bracha twice. So you think you made a bracha, not sure if you made a bracha, don't make a bracha again. Say, so why not? It should be marvel brachas. Have lots of blessings. So, well, yeah, lots of blessings is good, but a bracha levatala, a blessing uttered purpose, 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 purposelessly or needlessly or unnecessarily is a bad thing. That's a bad thing. You know what it's compared to? It's compared to taking Chas V'Sholom a Siddur, a Chumash, a holy book, and destroying it. Yeah. yeah. You don't just invoke God's name. You know how to do that. You have to treat God's name reverently. So to be able to make a bracha, that's, that's, a, that's a privilege. That's something special that's been afforded. Something special we get. You don't just make brachas. You're not allowed to make brachas just like that. And therefore... Because the recitation of brachas is rabbinic in nature, we have a principle. And the principle is, if in doubt, sit it out. Stand down. So what, You're what, not sure? Why when something happens good, you like invoke God's name? Like just the, is that well, we don't say Hashem's name. We don't use the ineffable name of God. You don't use the, God's formal names. You can use oh, God. Uh, okay, you, mystically, true. you can say Baruch Hashem all day and all night, and you should. Oh, yeah. oh okay. okay. But Hashem means? The name. The name. Okay. You don't say the name. When you make a bracha, you don't say Baruch Atah Hashem. You use Hashem's name. I see. Okay. And therefore, when a person makes a bracha unnecessarily, what does he have to do immediately afterwards? He's supposed to recite Baruch Shem Kavod Machuto Leolam Vaed. There's a question as to whether one is supposed to re recite a bracha when you put on the hand tefillin, which is one mitzvah, and then another bracha when you put on the head tefillin, which is another mitzvah. Oh. And everybody agrees that it's one mitzvah. But there is much commonality shared between these two mitzvahs. They, they ultimately comprise two parts of a whole, only each part is a whole unto itself. So there's two separate brachas. The bracha of putting on the tefillin is lehaniach, to fasten the tefillin, to place the tefillin. Because when it comes to the hand tefillin, the mitzvah is ukshartam. The mitzvah is you should actually fasten it. When it comes to the head tefillin, the mitzvah is the tefillin should be in place, rather than you shall place. As it says, they should be, the frontlets should be. And actually, the head film doesn't adjust easily. We can't adjust. There's different knots. One of the knots we have, the knot we use, you can adjust it somewhat easily to fit a larger head or a smaller head, but you don't adjust it on a regular basis. It is what it is. Whereas the hand film is constantly adjustable. You're fastening it. You don't just place it. So should you make another bracha knot? So the Rambam is of the opinion that you don't make another bracha unless you made an interruption. And the Altar Rebbe passes like the Rambam. And therefore, we recite the bracha lahaniach tefillin. We try not to make any interruption before we put on the headphone. And in doing so, you don't have to recite the second bracha. What happens if you said as much as umming between putting on the handphone and the headphone? Then you have to make the second bracha. You made an interruption. And those who make two brachas they make the second bracha and they immediately say, Baruch Shem Kavod Machutol, in case I made a bracha, which is unnecessary. 
So the Alter Rebbe says, so what are you putting yourself in case? Don't make a second bracha, which we don't do. We don't make a second bracha. But the premise of this entire exercise is that brachas are not simply recited. You don't say brachas mm -hmm. just like that. You don't invoke God's name just like that. Washing um, for bread, for example. Washing for bread, you make a bracha. And if you talk? You're in trouble. Right. You, you just have to wash again. <laughs> you wash again, but you don't make the bracha. Right. That's correct. And lots of washing we do during the course of the day, we don't make a bracha. Even though in some halachic codes, it says that you should make a bracha multiple times a day. But it, like, like before davening, one's supposed to wash their hands. But we don't do that. We do it only when it comes in the morning, the first time we do Natila Tadayim, and for doing it for bread. Why? Because we don't just make a bracha. Brachas are not to be taken lightly. Sometimes I meet people and they say, oh yeah, Rabbi, I had a bar mitzvah, and they start saying the brachas of the Aftar. I'm like, stop it, shh, don't. And they're like, what's wrong? Don't, I don't want to hear that now. Because, and I have to explain to them, because reciting a bracha is not appropriate just like that. So I'm glad you remember the brachas. Come to Shul, we'll try to get your mouth there. But don't just make the brachas. <laughs> right? Because brachas aren't recited for no reason. So here we, we, get, at, we get up, we say, Slach lanavino kichatano. Chal lanamakeinu givashano. I just made a request. I asked. And then I say, Ah, oh, God, bless you, God. You're chanun hamarba. I know you forgave me. How do you know God forgave you? How could you make a bracha? How could you make a bracha that God's chan on a marvelous lech? You don't know if he forgave you. And if he didn't forgive you, you have no right to make the bracha. What's the only possible answer? If we faithfully trust Hashem that if a yid actually asks for forgiveness, it must be he got forgiveness. Incidentally, this makes us realize we have to actually think what we're saying. Because if he said, Slach lano, lano, he didn't hear a word you said or mean a word you said or know a word you said, and then you make a bracha, chan on a marvelous lech, it's a little bit of a problem. How could you say Khan on a marvelous lech if you didn't even ask Hashem to forgive you? He can only forgive you if you actually ask forgiveness, which is part of tshuva, as we learned about yesterday. The idea of vidu dvarim. You have to actually verbalize and say. So if you say slach no, you're doing part of tshuva, you're getting the effect of tshuva in its fullest sense. You're obtaining the kapara, the atonement, then you could say Khan on a marvelous lech, assuming you actually did tshuva, which of course we should. The, 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 the Shmon Eser was not designed as a verbal exercise. It was designed as a dynamic and a real experience. That's how it was designed. You, you know what Dragon software is? No. No. That's when you when you can dictate to to the computer and it types your words up. Hmm. Right. So you can you can respond to emails or type out documents. So in order to do that, you have to read something first so that you recognize your voice. Hmm. So it gives you a number of different like. I, have no, I can't tell you why they choose these things, but one of the things you can read John F. Kennedy's uh, inauguration speech. <laughs> <laughs> or things like that. Like the famous speeches of the ages. Famous speeches that people gave. You, you read the speech and it follows through. Now, the dragon doesn't care if you actually mean what you're saying or you're just reading it because it just catches the inflection of your voice and it catches the way you pronounce words because every one of us pronounce words a little bit differently. And I suppose they analyze that speech and it's got enough different words that if you say these words, it's got a range and a gamut of what you might say, so it knows. And then the Dragon software also allows you to, to update your, your, your its voice recognition, whereas if you have a certain word that you use often, it, you can add that word in. And then it says, okay, now we recognize this word, and it constantly updates itself. It's really quite a fascinating system. The point, though, is that it doesn't mean matter if you meant what you read or not. You can just, that's meant as a, as a reading exercise. Just read so I can recognize your voice. The Shmon Esrei is not a reading exercise. It's not that you should say the words as quickly as you could so you can finish the davening. No, it's you should actually daven and mean what you say. Especially when you're making brachas, indicating that you trust that God actually listened to you. So the notion is that we are 100% certain that God has forgiven us. And the proof, the proof is in the bracha. We say, Safik brachas lahakil. Mishum chshash because we're concerned with the possibility of an unnecessary or purposeless bracha. There really is no doubt. It's really with absolute certitude. If we make the request, God surely responds. And guess what? Because the Shemoneser is real, and because our requests are real, 
If we wouldn't immediately slip back into a deficient form of service Hashem, we would even experience immediate redemption. Like the next bracha we make, Baruch Atah Hashem, Goyel Yisrael. We bless God who is the Redeemer. Not God who will redeem. Not Baruch Atah Hashem, Sheyi Goel, who will redeem. Baruch Atah Hashem, Goyel Yisrael. Because we're so certain Hashem is going to forgive us. So in that case, why would you get down? Why would you be sad? You did a virus? So what's the problem? You know God's going to forgive you. You know He loves you anyway. There's no, doubt, there's no doubt, there's no question here. You're coming back home. So in that case, you could be joyous. I mean, sure, you shouldn't be joyous with your sins. Oh, I'm so happy I did a sin. <laughs> no, you could be unhappy you did a sin. At the same time, be happy, Hashem's going to forgive me. You could experience both. You could do tshuva in harmony. And that's what the Alter Rebbe is talking about in chapter 11. He's talking about harmonious tshuva. A harmony of embitterment in the, in the heart. And at the same time, the concept of chedva, joy, and bechia, of, of weeping, of crying. Both can be in the heart at the same time. Why can't you balance the harmony in both? And he says, Even within the realm of what we're going to call human activity. That if a person comes and is sincere in requesting that you forgive them, that you have a halachic obligation to forgive them immediately. You shouldn't be cruel and indifferent to the pleading of a person who says, I regret it, I sincerely am sorry, please forgive me. You should forgive them right away. Right away. Right away. You should right away to forgive them. And what are we talking about? Somebody who got in your way, somebody who disabled your career advancement? No. Even if somebody who caused you to lose an arm. Even purposefully cut your arm off. Like it says in the end of the 8th chapter of Mesechet, Tract the Bava Kama. And it gets even worse. If this person who cut your arm off asks you with sincerity three times and you didn't forgive him, he doesn't have to ask you anymore. He made the request three times. That's it. He doesn't have to ask anymore. The Givonites, the David and Melech, beg their forgiveness. The David and Melech beg their forgiveness. Something he didn't do. But on behalf of the government of Israel, he apologized for what a previous king did. Much like sometimes prime ministers apologize for what a previous government did even though it's patently ridiculous when it's done 80 years later. So, but David HaMelech came right away and he said, I want to apologize for this. And, and, and the reason is, Shaul Shaul killed some of the Givayim. They said, we cannot forgive. Sorry. Mm-hmm. We cannot forget and forgive. Do you know what David HaMelech said about these people? Clearly, you don't have it in you to be Jewish. There's something wrong with you guys. If you were really Jewish, you would find it within you to forgive. Gaza, David, Aleim, Shalayovayu, Bekahal Hashem. David Mel says, in that case, then Givenites, you marry Givenites. But you're missing a critical gene in the Jewish system. It just, you're, you're, something's wrong with your souls. And I don't want you marrying into the rest of the Jewish people. We don't want to perpetuate this. Why? Because one of the things every year is supposed to have, Shaheim, Rachamanim. But they're compassionate. And compassion does not mean I'm blind to somebody's faults. Compassion does not mean I don't know what somebody did to me. Compassion means despite it all, I'm keenly aware, yet I find the compassion within my heart to be able to forgive them. Like it says in the 8th chapter of Masechet Yavamas. That's with regard to a person. In the measure of God, how much more so? Infinitely more so. If God expects a person to be able to forgive when somebody comes with sincerity, is there even a question that God would forgive us if we asked with sincerity? Self-understood. We faithfully trust. If I ask and I'm sincere, Hashem will forgive me. So what's the problem? Why can't you have harmony? I have, besides the fact that Alter Rebbe explains this in the 34th chapter of Tanya, which is ultimately a Zohara concept, of chedva tekiyah of having joy implanted on one side of the heart, 
and bechia to kia biliboy and have the sadness, well, not sadness, but bitterness, the moroseness, the sobriety that's implanted in the other part of the heart that the Zohar talks about this. And the Alter Rebbe said here, it's even more so. Because here, when you come and ask for the forgiveness, you're doing with faithful certitude that God is going to respond to you. You trust Him implicitly. He will surely forgive us. So why is it hard to be harmony? Why can't you do both? What's the issue? What's the issue? Rabbi Alter Rebbe, you just said in chapter 10, we can't do this. You told us we can't do this. You scheduled it for different days. And now you come with such simplicity, you say, of course it can be done. Harmonize, what's the problem? You have a big heart. On one side you'll feel one thing, on the other side you'll feel the other thing, especially in such a situation when you know that Hashem is going to forgive you. This actually borders on an egregious contradiction. It's not like the Alter Rebbe wrote this and then he came to, he said, you know what? After much thought and contemplation, we could probably even swing both. It's a chapter later. When he wrote chapter 10, he must have known what he's writing in chapter 11. When he printed chapter 10, he knew already, he had already articulated chapter 11. What happened here? So I'm going to conclude with a kernel, and it's just a kernel of a, of, of a long explanation that the Rebbe once gave us. The Rebbe spoke about this once, at, at, really at great length. And essentially, he identified two possibilities within a person who would need to do tshuva. He said there is a person who is still actively engaged in this kind of behavior. He's very much stuck in that mode. And when you're stuck in that mode, when you sit and contemplate that, it necessarily is going to so bring you sobriety. It's going to have to bring you down to some degree. It's not possible. It's not that you're free of this. This is something that you're dealing with actively right now. The person who right now is in the vortex of addiction. It's not that they have a lingering effect in, in the person who is addicted to alcohol is always an addict and therefore they can't even have a little drink because a little drink will simply open the gates of hell and everything reverts back to what it was. The person who was, was a, 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 an opiate addict, the smallest opiate, the smallest amount of hallucinogenic could literally cause everything to come crashing down. So you're always in a certain sense a recovering addict. An addict is always in recovery. That's, that's the terminology, the technical terminology we use. The person who's an addict, the person either is, is in, uh, indicted right now or in recovery. And you never leave recovery behind. And the halacha would be that people like this actually cannot drink four glasses of wine at the same time. You're not allowed to. Because, because there's a health issue. Because you're in recovery. Because once you became an addict, once you abused this to the point that it became destructive, you're not allowed to go back then. So sometimes we're addicted to sin. And, and, and we can't see the pulse as away from it. And we know it's destructive, and it harms us. It, it, it exacts a tremendous toll, but, but we're just struggling with it. We're, we're literally in the thick of things. So in that case, Alter Rebbe says, ruminating in this and, and, and contemplating this, it, it requires, it's, it's gonna, gonna bring about some kind of sobriety. It's, it's gonna make you shrivel. It's gonna make you, it's gonna make you kind of, uh, you know, Instead of being expansive, and instead of experiencing the, the, the liberating sense of joy, this kind of feeling is going to cause you to contract with him. And it's not reasonable for that to happen at the same time. It's not reasonable. Al Tabi says, you know, that, that contracting feeling cannot live in harmony with the expansive feeling of joy. I can't I can't be shriveled and at the same time expand. But then we could talk about a person who was involved in negative activities, and he's not perfect, but he's a bainini. He's a bainini, which means he still struggles with temptation. He still deals with the realities of the possibility of sin, but at the same time, he's about tshuva. He's a person who has moved on. And because this is a person who's moved on, it actually doesn't bring him down. It doesn't mean there isn't a residual effect. In fact, there's this notion that a person should look at the pork sandwich, and he should say, F she, I could eat that, looks great. My essa, what should I do? Avi Shabashmaim goes that alike. My father in heaven has, 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 has decreed I shouldn't eat it. There's nothing wrong with pork. It's not any different than, than veal. What's the difference? Hashem decreed, that's why I shouldn't eat it. However, the Maggid of Mizrich taught that the other Gemara that says that a person should say, Efshi, I can't, that refers to a person who actually was eating this and actually has a certain comfort with it. And once you became comfortable with it because it's something you used to eat, then in that case, there's always a residual kind of comfort. There's always some kind of connection that stay, lingers on. 
And because of that, if you make a callous statement like that, oh, sure, I'd love to have a double helping, <coughs> but you know, I can't do it because Yiddish can't prohibit, prohibits me. That would not be a healthy st statement for a person like that to make. So we're talking about, on one hand, about tshuva, who's engaged, who's actively involved with this. When you have to do tshuva for that, it's not going to come in a joyous way. But when you're talking about a person who's gone past that, who's transcended that, that's here what chapter 11 says, it is possible to do tshuva in harmony. To be continued. <laughs>